One of my favorite pastimes is jumping into a big old black hole. So it makes sense that I'm a big fan of the game Outer Wilds, because the shader effect that they have in this game is really cool. So I'm going to show you the process that I use to recreate this in Unity. And I don't think there's a real reason to wait around, so let's just jump on in. Alright. So the actual phenomenon that we're looking at here is something called gravitational lensing. Because a black hole is so densely packed with matter, it can actually bend the light rays that go around it. And let me make a really crude drawing to help illustrate this complicated idea. Imagine that you're chilling in space, looking at a black hole, which I've appropriately colored in white ink. Usually when you look at something, you're seeing the reflected light off of it, which travels in pretty much straight lines. But due to the gravitational force of a black hole, it might actually bend these light rays so you perceive an object at a different location than it actually is. And this would distort your perception like crazy. You might even see the same object in two completely different locations. We're gonna have to be clever and fake a couple things, because the math's a little complicated for a real-time application. But it gives us a really good starting point for something to work towards. And for a first step, we're gonna have to make some 3D models for our project. Alright, fine, it's like a little bit more complicated, but not really by that much. This sphere actually isn't only going to be the black hole, I'm going to have it do two separate effects. The first is going to be to render the black hole in the center of it, and the second will be a transparent distortion effect that goes around the outer edges of the sphere. There's a problem though. I want to be able to jump into this black hole, right? But due to backface calling, as soon as I actually enter this mesh, everything's going to turn invisible. That's because we're looking at the backsides of all these triangles, which aren't rendering anymore. So I'm going to end up flipping the normals on this mesh. It still keeps the same silhouette, but now I can get as close as I want to it and still see everything, even if I move around. And don't worry if this doesn't make total sense right now, when I bring it into Unity it's going to become a lot more clear. Alright, so I've taken our mesh and I've brought it into Unity. Once I fight my way through all these context menus, we're going to have an empty shader graph to work with. The first thing I'm going to do is to change the blend type to transparent. That's because we're reading from the scene color buffer and then modifying it to get that effect. So I plop down a scene color node and then feed in our screen coordinates to sample from it. And if you're using the universal render pipeline like I am, you'll notice that it didn't do anything. That's because there's one flag you have to flip before this will actually work. In your universal render pipeline settings, you'll see a checkbox for the opaque texture. You're going to want to turn that on. Awesome. Now we have a shader that's not doing anything. But for now I'm going to tint the whole result red, just so we can kind of see the area of influence that it has. The first thing I want to tackle is rendering the black hole in the center of this object. But remember, there's no mesh there, because we're only using the shell of a sphere. So the way I'm going to do this is by determining it mathematically by ray tracing with our camera's view vector. In our shader, I can get the world space position of our camera. And I can also get the world space position of the pixel that we're currently rendering. The view vector is just the line that connects these two dots. I also know that I want to render the black hole at the center of our object with some given radius. So I really just need a formula that does an intersection test between a line and a sphere. If they do intersect, I know that I want to render the black hole for this pixel. And luckily this is super common in game development, so there's a lot of resources online that tell you how to do this intersection test. This is the part of the video where I bombard you with a wall of code, but this function basically does the ray sphere intersection test that I was talking about. It's going to return three important variables. The first variable is called hit, which just returns zero if there was no intersection, and one if there was an intersection point between our line and sphere. I also return the closest intersection point in world space with this hit position variable, and I also include the sphere's surface normal in this hit normal variable, because it's super easy to calculate for a sphere. It's just the normalized difference between the intersection point and the center of the sphere. You can use the custom function node in the shader graph in order to call that function that we just wrote. And all I'm really doing here is just plugging in the inputs that we were talking about before. I'm going to interpolate between our background color and our black hole color based off of whether or not that intersection test passed. And the black hole color is really simple because it's just, you know, black. But now we actually have our shader doing something. We have a nice black hole rendering right in the middle of our sphere. And no matter where I move to, it always stays right in the middle there. And to be honest, this is pretty much it for the black hole part. But I am going to add one super small detail. Since we computed the normal of the black hole, I'm going to throw it into a Fresnel effect just so I can get an outer glow on the edges of the sphere. And for my own personal preference, I'm raising this to a super high power because I want this to be really subtle. But here's the result from that. 
Whoa, what a massive difference. Okay, now it's time to work on distorting the background. Right now we're doing something really simple. We're just sampling the background based off of the screen's UV coordinates. But we can modify this UV coordinate before we actually sample from the scene color. I set up this network as an example for something you can do. It's fairly simple. It's just taking a sine wave over the height of the screen. And then I'm taking that value and I'm adding it to the X coordinate of our UVs. So you'll get a result similar to this. It's oscillating where you're sampling the background left and right. And this is honestly the backbone of how you do the gravitational lensing effect. We're gonna take our screen coordinates and modify them in a clever way to fake that lensing effect. I wanna take a look at the effect in Outer Wilds just to help us figure out how we're gonna recreate this. Check out how this beam of light appears on both sides of the black hole. As our UV sample is getting closer and closer to the black hole, it's getting pushed along this vector. And that vector is just the line that's connecting our screen position with the center of the black hole in screen space. If we're gonna recreate this, we're gonna need the position of those two points in screen space in order to figure out what that vector is. And I've created another custom function to help us. You don't really need to know the details of this, but all it's doing is taking an arbitrary world position and then transforming it into its screen space coordinates. So in our shader, if I subtract the screen position from our black hole position in screen space and then normalize that vector, we're getting that direction that points from the screen position towards the center of the black hole. And then if I start pushing our UV sample along this vector, we're gonna start seeing that distortion effect. And just as a side note, I'm getting rid of this red tinting color effect because I don't think we're gonna need it anymore. So now if you look at the effect in game, you'll notice that it's really bad. But that makes sense because everything's getting pushed by the exact same amount, so it ends up kind of just looking like a magnifying glass. What we really need is an intensity mask. So the outer edges of the sphere don't affect the distortion as much. And as we get closer and closer to the center, the distortion becomes more and more intense. A good starting candidate is to use the Fresnel effect because the result from the Fresnel effect is the same regardless of the viewing angle on a sphere. The Fresnel effect is the dot product between the viewing angle and the surface normal. And when both of those vectors are normalized, it's actually just equal to the cosine angle between the two vectors. If you invert this, it's already a pretty good intensity mask. But the fall off on the distortion would follow the curve from the cosine angle. And I generally try to work with linear functions for things like this. But you can make this linear by taking the arc cosine of the curve, which now provides a linear falloff. It's not a big deal, but I think this is easier to work with, because you can transform a linear function into a lot of other functions pretty easily. And even though I over-engineered this problem, it's only a couple nodes that we have to copy into our graph here. And now when we take a look at the result, there's a much smoother transition of the distortion from the outer ring towards the center. But there's definitely still improvements we need to make in order to polish it up. For one, the offset in screen space doesn't take into account the distance it is from the camera. So when you zoom out, the effect looks like it's getting stronger for no real reason. Instead, we need to make the intensity scale with the size of the black hole on screen. And trigonometry is here to save the day. We know a perspective camera is defined by some field of view, right? So that's the angle that I'm marking with theta here. If we have an object within our field of view, we want to calculate roughly how much screen space it's taking up. We can figure out the width of the camera frustrum at that point because we can split this up into a right angle triangle. And from the trigonometric identities, we can write an equation like this. Tan of theta over two is equal to B over A. That's the opposite side over the adjacent side. We're trying to solve for whatever that B value is. And that's fairly easy to do so. We just have to rewrite the equation by moving the A over to the other side. And now that we've solved for that, we can get the full width of the camera frustrum by just doubling it and stacking it on top of each other. And we can get an estimation of the object's screen percentage by taking the ratio of the object scale relative to the width of the camera frustrum. And this is the boring code that does that. It's basically just scaling our intensity value based off of its screen percentage. But check out the result from that change. The intensity looks so much more consistent as we look at it from different distances. And at this point, I'd like to say, congratulations! We technically finished the minimum viable product for the shader. Here's the thing though. The parameters on this thing right now are embarrassingly limited. So for our own quality of life, we need to add some stuff here to spruce it up. The first should be a scalar that just controls the radius of our black hole. That way we can make it bigger or smaller without too much of a hassle. 
We also need to be able to control the distortion. I've done this by including an intensity multiplier, as well as an exponential falloff. Lastly, I just have some parameters to control the glow around the black hole. These are your common Fresnel inputs, intensity, falloff, as well as just a color parameter to change the tint of it. So now I think we're pretty much done. Or are we? Remember when I said this? You'll see a checkbox for the opaque texture. You're gonna wanna turn that on. Yeah, so I was just straight up lying to you. The problem with the opaque texture is that it's not gonna include any transparent objects in it. So if we have something like these transparent particles in our background, because they're not opaque, they're not included in the opaque texture. So when we sample that texture in our black hole shader, it's not gonna include any of these particles that are behind it. So you're probably wondering how I'm gonna solve this problem. And the secret is I'm not going to. A common game dev tip is just to go on GitHub and find somebody who's already solved it in the public domain and just use their code. This is a renderer feature that lets you take the current frame buffer after rendering transparent and then copy it into a temporary texture. If you tweak some settings, you can render the black hole after those events and use that temporary texture as your background source. The only thing left is to throw it into a demo scene because we're actually done this time. Or are we? Yeah, no, we, no, we actually are done this time.